Thank you. Um, Dr. Jadot holds a PhD in marine biology, as well as uh, two masters of science, one in oceanography and one in biology. She also furthered her training in sustainability, leadership and green investing at uh, Harvard University. So I think uh, you will agree that she has a unique academic background for her work on the blue economy, as well as sustainable development. She's originally from Belgium, uh, now working out of uh, Florida. Uh, but her work has led her to work with uh, communities around the world, including in Europe, the Caribbean, Africa, and Middle East. Um, she previously worked in academia, but now she uh, works with a consulting firm, uh, Elemental Solutions. And uh, this consulting firm provides support and advice to government agencies, to nonprofit organizations, as well as corporations. She's also a board member of Seaweed First, which is a French nonprofit organization that focuses on moving the world towards a sustainable blue economy. So she works with governments of 25 different island states, right from the Pacific to the Caribbean and from pole to pole um, around developing strategies that will help sustain uh, uh, small island developing states to become resilient to climate change and also strengthen their blue economy. So she has a busy travel uh, schedule. We're very pleased that she was able to take time to present the seminar. For, for instance, she was just recently in uh, New Caledonia, which is in the South Pacific. And then apparently she's off next week to travel to the Falkland Islands, which is in the Southern Atlantic. So very hectic um, and difficult uh, travel schedule. So we're very much looking forward to hearing, uh, Catherine, your seminar about the blue economy and building resilience to climate change in small island developing states with a focus on the Caribbean. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. So good morning, everybody. My name is Catherine Jadot, and I'm a consultant in climate resilience and the blue economy. Um, today, I would like to start with a short introduction about the blue economy and then move on to what the blue economy means for the small island developing states or SIDS, um, especially in the Caribbean. And what are the challenges and opportunities in the blue economy for those um, territories? Um, as Chris mentioned, um, oh, I don't think you mentioned that. So we will have some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So I would like to invite you to write them down so we can um, answer your questions and talk more about it at the end of the presentation. So we've got a lot to cover. So let's jump into it. Um, as you know, the ocean cover almost three quarters of the Earth's um, surface and are home to more than half of all life forms. And this very often um, creates uh, a false impression that oceans have limitless um, resources. And this leads to a massive overexploitation and degradation um, of the ocean with an impact that reaches far beyond um, their shores. And in the Caribbean, the Caribbean, virtually the entire population live in coastal regions. And this represents uh, millions of people. And, and all those people could get value from the ocean and coastal region through sustainable blue economy. So this really means that the ocean and coastal um, regions provide us human uh, considerable economic and, and, and environmental benefits. So before we move further into this seminar, I would like to ask you two questions and we have two calls for you. The first question um, is for me to get a sense of um, how familiar you are with the blue economy so that I can adjust uh, what I will be talking about uh, during this seminar. And the second one is to try to gauge what you think that seeds can most benefit from the blue economy. So Erin, if you could pull up the first poll, please. Just, la I launch it, I'm assuming, correct? Yes. It's launched. All right. So if you could take a couple minutes, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, 
answer the two questions. How familiar are you with the blue economy? I never heard about this before. I've heard about it, but I'm not too sure. Or I have a good understanding of what the blue economy is. And the second question is, in which of these areas do you think that SIDS can most benefit from the development and implementation of the blue economy? So do you think it's in job opportunities, education and research, business opportunities, food security, climate resilience, all of the above, none of the above, or you're not sure, it depends. All right, and then we'll have the third question for the end. All right. Aaron, do you see if everybody has answered? We are 13 of 20, 14 of 20. Come on, these are not hard questions. Take <laughs> just a second to answer. All right, how are we doing, Aaron? We're 16 of 20 now, so we could. We yeah, we probably can, can you can you read the answers or the percentages? So in uh, question one, 47 percent have never heard of this before. 41 percent have heard about it. And the rest, um, I have a good understanding of blue economy is 12 percent. OK, very good. And on question okay. two, the majority is 65 percent for all the above and about 6% for job opportunities, business opportunities, food security, and 12% for climate resilience. All right, interesting, interesting. We'll see if you still think the same at the end of this uh, seminar. Um, so what is the blue economy? So the blue economy is a term um, that is, that's been really gaining traction since 2012. And, and it's commonly defined along the lines of the definition that you see here on, on, on the slide um, that is centered around the triple bottom line of sustainability, where the environment is protected, um, society is equal, enhanced and safeguard, and the economy has grown. However, it is widely acknowledged that achieving this triple helix today is, is challenging practice. And, and the complexity of meeting these um, triple goals is really highlighted in the complexity of the sustainable development goals uh, that have been set under Agenda 2030. Um, there are 17 goals, um, and we will talk a little bit more about those different goals and how the blue economy links to those goals in a minute. But, but in recent reviews of the disclosure, um, surrounding the blue economy and the definition of the blue economy, um, it has been clearly shown that um, it really varies across different purposes, depending on the people using it and the context um, within which it's being set. So as it currently sits, uh, the definition is really fluid and, and it's open to being employed by different people with different priorities. So why for many, the blue economy really represents a bright spot, you know, a point of optimism where the, for, the force of um, economic growth uh, might be balanced or, or metered or, or met um, by those diverse, um, uh, by those drivers and, and, and efforts for the protection and enhancement of environmental and social conditions. For others, um, there are real concerns that the blue economy is yet another mode of greenwashing or blue washing to cover ocean grabbing and, and furthering an, an, an unsustainable expo exploitation of the marine environment. So fundamentally, why the blue economy um, policies and, and activity are forging forward, their definition um, is for many still under formation. So if you look here um, uh, at the word cloud on the right, um, it represents the review of over 30 national, um, uh, national level blue economy policy and, and four regional policy and numerous 
development programs, which aims at furthering uh, the uptake and the progression of the blue economy as a way to meet the sustainable development goals and the agenda 2030. So we can see here and um, where the size of the words is indica indicative of the number of times they appear in the blue economy policy um, aims that have been identified in this study, we can see the importance of marine resources as an economic or business opportunity. And with the words of uh, like environment and, and, and sustainable, sustainable as strong, they are much or smaller than those indicating business or economic aspects of, you know, such as maritime or um, economic or economy. And we can see that local community cultural heritage elements of the blue economy, which are things that people feel so strongly is part of the definition, are way down uh, the stack in order. And you really have to search uh, to find them in, in that word cloud. So we can see that there is really a misalignment between the current definition um, and the current focus of blue economy policies around the world. Uh, however, when we really look further than the current policies, um, we can actually identify from all the different uses of the term blue economy, um, a set of proposition that we need to think through um, into, into really use to guide um, um, at least some of our practice. And the first one is that um, society, societies must look to the ocean to secure their food, um, uh, the food, energy, and wider um, economic uh, futures as a source of resources. And that the oceans are maybe not a frontier to go and plunder, but they are really a source of an important part, uh, of an important part of uh, humanity's future. The second is that our ocean offer enormous opportunity for economic development. So there are jobs to create and new industry to be built, new futures to be made. The third is that um, realizing all those opportunities will require a significant investment in science and technology. And it, it will really require um, to actually mobilize the, those resources in a particular way that is really intentional. Um, fourth, and perhaps the most contentious of those proposition is that growth must involve a fundamental transition to ecologically and socially sustainable um, economic activities. Um, we, we do not want to, um, to do to the seas any more that we have already done or to do you know, the same that we've done to, to the land. We must do economy differently, including how we man manage marine resources. So if you take a broader conception of economy, it's not just a set of activities conducted by a firm, but we need to include regulations and management interventions in the use, uh, in, in the framing of resources and investments. We must include thinking about management and, and management of those resources. So in short, um, for the, if we want to reach the integrated and, and sustainable use of marine resources, we cannot simply look at economic growth. Uh, we need to move beyond that. And, and this just open up uh, a warm, uh, a kind of worms, uh, and we will talk more about it in a minute when we'll talk about the donut economy. But it is an important point uh, to point out, at least now, so we can um, uh, have that as a framework in our thinking. And it is crucial, uh, it's a crucial dimension uh, and a good starting point. So what is traditionally uh, included in the blue economy? Um, so the blue economy 
most of the time is viewed as the part of the economy that includes all sectoral and cross-sectoral economic activity, activities related to the ocean, the seas and the coast. So you, you would have established sectors, you, ha you would have emerging sectors, and you also have a series of enabling conditions that you need to have in order to promote the blue economy. So let me explain a few more commonly known examples of the blue economy activities. So the most well known, of course, um, is the extraction of living things, such as selfish and algae and other life forms in the sea. So these are being exploited in fisheries and, and, and aquacultures, and those activities also include, you know, the processing and the trade of these resources. Another example of sector is uh, the maritime transport business, um, which is a very important uh, sector in the globalized market. And it is uh, most visible in the form of container ship uh, or uh, oil and gas tankers that you can see across the ocean. And of course, all the boats and vessels will require ports and marina and storage, and all these have to be constructed and administered and managed. So shipbuilding, ship repair business is another important sector in the global blue economy. A little bit less in, in the seas in the Caribbean, but not for all of them. For example, Freeport in the Bahamas has a very, very large uh, shipbuilding um, um, uh, sector. And, and finally, um, we also include um, coastal tourism in the blue economy. Uh, it is one of the largest sectors in terms of employment and certainly in the Caribbean. And it includes all coastal activities from nautical sports such as diving, windsurfing, kite surfing, um, to coastal hotels, excursions, and wining and dining. So this is certainly a leading sector in the Caribbean, um, but it's not the only one, of course. And, and you know, actually much can be said oh, about the over-reliance of the Caribbean in that one sector of the blue economy in terms of um, economic resilience. And, and we have seen how the COVID pandemic has really highlighted the need for the Caribbean to diversify their blue economy, to really increase their um, economic resilience. So all of these sectors uh, employ about uh, 4 million people with coastal tourism being responsible for the employment of over half of those people. Um, but the, the blue economy is also interconnected with many other activities and its impact goes way beyond the, those sectors that I just mentioned. So you also have new and emerging sectors that you can see here at the bottom of this infographic. Um, uh, and those have a huge potential and, and they really offer a large of variety of new employment opportunities for the Caribbean and an opportunity to diversify their economy. Um, for example, um, ocean energy has become an, import, an important subsector in the blue economy with offshore wind farms that would produce you know, a, a significant part of the inert, uh, energy consumed. And this, this will require, of course, um, many new professions and they will offer new employment in construction, maintenance and administration. Another branch of the um, uh, emerging sector in the ocean energy field is um, uh, the deployment of wave and tidal energy system and installation. And finally, um, there is the young and emerging sector of uh, biotechnology, um, which is marine organisms such as algae or bacteria, but also fish and, and, and shellfish to find new applications in healthcare, beauty products, um, energy production, and many other areas. 
Um, so in, in recent years, the emerging sectors have grown exponentially and they, they really offer a significant uh, potential for uh, economic developments and jobs, um, especially in renewable energies today. So the blue economy not only offers significant direct employment, but also many indirect jobs and, and th that are connected to the blue economy, um, such as suppliers from different sectors and service providers, um, among others. Um, and of course, all these sectors will be different from, um, from one region to another one, and even from, from one island to another one. We talked about sustainability that needs to be embedded in every aspect, in every sectors of the blue economy. But, but what does it really mean to have a sustainable blue economy? So a sustainable blue economy is an economy that restores, protects, and maintains the diversity, productivity, resilience, and core function of marine ecosystems. So really preserving the natural capital upon which um, the blue economy really depends. A sustainable blue economy, it's also based on clean technology and renewable energy, um, which really gonna secure um, economic and social stability over time while keeping within the limits of, of the, 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 the planet. And finally, a blue economy also provides social and economic benefits uh, for current and future generation um, by contributing to food security, poverty eradication, uh, livelihoods, income, employment, health, safety, equity, and political stability. So you can see it's a, it's a really tall order and there are a few challenges before we can get there. And, and we will um, talk about those in a minute. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to go a little bit more into details about what uh, the different type of activities and the different type of industries, but also the different um, drivers for growth that we can find in the blue economy. So I'm not going to go into details um, for all of them, but I just want to highlight um, a couple of maybe industries because even though we know that sustainability must underline everything that we are doing or the way we are thinking about the blue economy, we can already see here that it will be challenging for many of those industry to be completely sustainable. Um, of course, it's gonna be more challenging for the oil and gas uh, uh, industry, but also something even more challenging like desalination. Um, we know that um, this is typically very taxing for the environment to run a desal plant. And when we think about the existing freshwater demand uh, that will increase in the coming years due to climate change and the water stock that are going to decrease, we know that this is going to be um, very challenging to keep this, to, to make this industry um, green and sustainable, which really um, highlights the fact that we need to, to develop better technologies to make all those different sectors more sustainable. So let's, let's take a step back and see what we've talked about um, so far. So we've seen that the blue economy is diverse between and among countries and also between and among regions. Um, we've seen that today uh, there is still no international agreement on how the blue economy should be enacted and what it should include or not. Um, we see that there is still much to be ne negotiated in defining the blue economy to make sure we are all talking about the same thing when, you use, the way we use that term. And we also need to embed sustainability in every step and every sector of the blue economy. So I think it's worth reminding ourselves um, that the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, um, and different aspects of sustainability are intrinsically uh, linked. 
for so many goals, um, meeting uh, the different targets or, or achieving another target is, is absolutely essential. What I mean by that is that, for example, here, if we look at the SDG 14, which is life below water, and you can see, oops, and we can see on the um, left-hand side, the different targets uh, for that SDG. Um, we have uh, preventing significantly, uh, uh, prevents and significantly um, reduce marine pollution of all kinds. We have another goal, 14.2, uh, that is uh, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystem to avoid significant uh, adverse impacts and to take action for their restoration. We have minimizing and addressing the impact of ocean acidification. We have effectively regulate, regulate fish harvesting and end overfishing. We have conserve at least 10% um, 10% of coastal and, and marine areas, eliminate uh, certain types, uh, certain forms of subsidies uh, that contributes to overcapacity and overfishing. And finally, we have uh, increasing the economic benefits uh, to small island developing states uh, from sustainable use of marine resources. So what I would like you to do right now um, is to, Tell me what you think, what you think, um, how, tell me how you think that reaching any of those targets of SDG 14 will benefit these other goals here. So for example, uh, and I would like to invite you to take, oops, to take uh, the annotation tool that you should see on the bottom of your screen. Do you guys see that? Do you guys see on the bottom of your screen um, on, on the bar, you should see um, annotate, it's a little pen. Christoph, Erin, do you see that? I'm just working on this now, Catherine. I do not see it. Chris or Doug is on the bottom of your screen. Uh, no, I can't see it either. All right. So just take a minute for yourself. You won't be able to annotate the slide, but have a look at those different um, targets here and see how you can link achieving those targets to moving towards, towards achieving those different goals. So the goals are no poverty, um, zero hunger, uh, good health, um, quality education, gender e equality, uh, clean water, clean energy, um, economic growth, um, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna give you the answer right here. It doesn't come, there we go. So here, for example, if we look at targets 14.2 uh, and, and environment restoration, we can see, uh, so for that, for that target, it was set in uh, by the 2030 agenda and it was to sustainably manage and protect uh, marine and coastal ecosystem to avoid, to avoid significant impact. And we can see how reaching that target um, will support the achievement, the achievement of other uh, SDGs like no poverty, zero hunger, or even having uh, sustainable cities and communities. So we really see how intricate um, all those um, um, targets and SDGs are and, and how, co how achieving the targets in SDG 14 will really co-benefit um, different um, SDGs. Um, so overall, we can really see that, you know, um, we, this, the, being able to achieve um, ocean sustainability is not only um, necessarily for the ocean, 
um, and, and to, 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 to improve ocean ecosystems benefit, but is really make um, a wide reaching um, need uh, that we need to prioritize in order to achieve the SDGs. So let's look at the, at the, the challenges to achieve, um, to achieve the blue economy, a sustainable blue economy. So one of the challenges, of course, um, um, making sure that the blue economy is sustainable in all the different sectors that we just talked about. Um, another challenge is actually moving from the chart you see on the left to the chart you see on the right. So on the left, we can see the prevailing blue economy approach in, in, in many cities, in, in many parts of the world, not only cities, where on the right, we can see the blue economy framework that we should have or at least try to have. So the existing uh, framework on the left really encompasses linear comp compartmentalized um, sectoral approach with weak connections and linkages and synergies between the different uh, uh, an intervention uh, scale. Uh, could it be global, international, or even national, and also in the different sectors. And the desired and, and needed blue economy framework that you can see on the right-hand side really offer an, an integrated and, and systemic, systemic, dynamic, um, and ecosystem-based um, approach in which um, sectorial barriers are minimized uh, at the activity and the governance level, where you will have um, an environmental, um, social, and, and economic dimensions uh, that are intertwined and pursued uh, for all blue economy activities. And, and it's important to, to mention that this sustainable blue economy uh, must build on, on integrated coastal zone management because this really centers um, on the ecosystem and, but also embeds uh, the principle of the green economy in a blue world, uh, basically taking into account the three pillars of, of environmental, economic and, and social sustainability. So in this slide here, we can see um, the tools and opportunities of the blue economy um, based on this integrated holistic intersectoral um, development space we just talked about that is anchored on, on the quadruple bottom line where you have the cultural, um, the economic and, and environmental and social aspects that are taken into account. Um, and, and, and where we can really see um, a development uh, success that is uh, measured in economic terms, as well as on the basis of an environmental um, uh, stewardship and social responsibility and, and governance transparency uh, standing. So again here, I would like to highlight the fact that it is really important uh, to measure real economic progress as part of the blue economy strategies um, and not just um, financial growth. And, and the Caribbean is really uniquely placed um, to evolve and innovate um, economic metrics uh, in, in order to provide decision makers with a more complete picture of the health of the whole economy, rather than a narrow picture provided by, by for example, the GDP alone, as it is done today. And, and a, a commonly desired outcome um, expressed by, by countries and, and SIDS working toward um, establishing a sustainable blue economy really involves a, a desire for increased human well being and the maintenance and, and even enhancement of environmental and, and ecological health. So these three elements are um, inherently um, qualitative rather than purely quantitative. Um, and, and, and therefore it will require us to think um, which economic tools 
to include in our um, economic toolkit. And one of the models that is often used is the model of um, what you can see here. Um, it's which is called the donut economy. So we can really see that in the early days, um, the blue economy included a notion of blue growth, really to, to mirror um, the central goal of um, economic policy around the world, which is economic growth, financial monetary growth. However, um, the notion of blue economy really continued to, to, to evolve. And, and today, the notion of um, continued growth in, in perpetuity um, has really been challenged. And it seems now evident uh, uh, that perpetual growth cannot be achieved within the boundaries of, of, the, of the planetary ecosystem. So over the past decades, um, you have new paradigms uh, that have emerged to reframe um, what the blue economy is or really should be. Um, and this is synthesized um, in, in what is called the blue donut to actually mirror um, the donut economy model that was developed in 2017 by Kate um, Rogworth. Um, who is an economist at the University of Oxford in the UK. Um, and her model calls for uh, an economy that is regenerative, distributive, and circular. So you can see um, uh, a schematic uh, that synthesizes that uh, new economy called the, the, the donut economy that use uh, the visual metaphor of a donut, where you would have here uh, the outer, outer edge representing the, the planetary ecosystem boundaries um, that the economy cannot overshoot. Um, and it's really the, the ecological uh, ceiling. And the inner edge of the donut represents um, the social foundation, the, the so, so societal objectives that we need to achieve in order to prevent people from falling into the hole. And then from there, um, you can have activities and investment that can be prioritized with a focus on, on activities and investments that, that address human well being uh, shortfalls. You're preventing people to fall into the hole or even pulling them out of the hole. Um, and really, uh, 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 we need to focus on those to reduce um, um, to reduce our impact on on planetary ecosystems. So, how do we get there? Um, well, it's not going to be easy uh, for sure. Um, but we have five key components that have been identified, and the first one is. Um, ecosystem-based based marine spatial uh, management. Um, so ecosystem-based uh, spatial management is, is an, it's an emerging paradigm um, of integrative ocean management that really recognize the full array of interaction within an ecosystem, in, including human users, rather then considering you know, single uses, single species or ecosystem service in, in isolation. Um, so at its core, it is a recognition um, that ecosystem and human well-being are interconnected and that con conventional sectoral management and, and piecemeal gover government, governance um, have proven less effective um, to reach ocean sustainable development. So the second area is um, the need for multi-level cooperation between islands. And this is really crucial um, to reap the full potential of the blue economy. So the policy silos that exist between islands to manage marine resources uh, is really increasingly 
recognized as a um, barrier to reach true transformation and, and transforming our world and shifting towards sustainable development really requires interaction between the different islands to take a higher um, um, level of governance. And, and islands really must learn um, to, to dance together, you know, um, to be guided by, by a shared vision and coherent policies that, that really encourage working together and, and shared data. Um, we will not get um, the level of sustainability we want to have if every island is having a different type of um, vision for what sustainability means. Then third, um, we need better interactions um, and integration within the islands um, to break governance silos uh, within each island. Um, because in, in many cities uh, in the Caribbean and around the world, um, there is really a lack of cross-ministerial um, ministerial, uh, mechanism for um, coordination of efforts to really cap capitalize on the potential of the blue economy. So um, we need to have ministries of fisheries and transport and energy and tourism and, and commerce and, and, and environment to create together um, a choreography and in, in, in uh, a set of policies that can um, increase in interconnection um, and inter interconnected governance with respect to marine affairs. And this is something, something we really don't see today. And this is really hindering um, the progression towards a sustainable blue economy. Four, um, we also need to recognize that the advancement of ocean science and technology is, is really key here. Um, as we were talking about for um, the desalination process, we still have a lot of industries, industry today that need to be um, made more sustainable, that, that needs to be greener or bluer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and this will only happen um, with true innovation and in, in new um, ocean science. Um, and we also need to um, allow to, to gather more data and more knowledge um, to really um, fill the series of knowledge gaps um, that really slow down uh, or progression towards um, these goals, like you know, limited data availability that is rampant in the different cities uh, in the Caribbean and, and elsewhere. Um, we also need to increase our um, um, limited knowledge on, on the sensitivity of various ecosystem uh, components um, to different stressors um, linked to climate change or not. And we also need to have uh, to increase uh, our understanding of current and future interaction among different stakeholders and, and possible conflicts mitigation options. Um, because as we demand more and use more the ocean, um, we can expect more uh, potential possible conflicts uh, between the different users. So we need to be able to, to um, have an understanding of what's happening today, but what will happen once we have completely developed um, and, and, and uh, um, developed the, the blue economy. So um, this will also um, allow to respond um, to the expanding demand of ocean driven so uh, food um, and, and material and energy. We have to make it, um, the extraction of those resources have to, be, have to be made in a sustainable manner. Hence the need to advance science, um, uh, science technology and, 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 and ocean science. And finally, we also need to unlock private investments um, because there is no doubt that doing all those steps and achieving all those goals um, will need um, massive uh, investments. And we need to make those investments uh, palatable and exciting also for the private sector to make sure that we can fully develop 
um, a sustainable blue economy. And Erin, that's all I have for you guys today. So um, Erin, can I ask you to pull the last poll? It's still up. So if everyone can fill oh. in this question, yes. I don't see the results of the poll. So if you can let me know. Yeah, we're just, uh, if everyone can finish uh, question three, then I'll end the poll, so. I, I don't see it either, so. Okay, let me see here. Okay, let's try it again. Yeah, it kicked me out, but I can share results right now for what we saw. Some people did fill out. Nobody fell asleep. Everyone was engaged. How's that, yes. Catherine? <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> okay. Can you see the poll now? It's it's uh, it's. Yes, really I can. Thank you. So people didn't get to the, to the third one, but. Perfect. All right. Cool. I believe we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so yes, if uh, if you have questions, either uh, ask them directly, or perhaps you can um, you can use the chat uh, function to uh, prepare some questions. I have one which <laughs> basically follows up on on your um, on your last point, which was uh, increased private sector investment. I think most. Uh, decision makers in the Caribbean would agree that access to uh, you know financial resources is the, is a huge problem uh, and over reliance on um, you know organizations like the International Development Bank World Bank Caribbean Development Bank for investment is not sustainable so I guess I'm interested in your views about how, we can make uh, investment from the private sector more palatable, as you said, within the Caribbean or even among uh, SIDS uh, generally uh, globally. That's an excellent question. And it's a really hot topic right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of, the, one of the things that we see is that traditional investors shy away from the Caribbean region or the seeds in general, because there is a lack of understanding of the market. So they will favor markets that are more familiar with, that have a better um, track record of success and higher return on their investments. So one of the, one of the things that we are doing uh, with Seaweed First, for example, is trying to create indices and, 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 and table that will be readily available and easy to understand for different types of investors. Uh, and another problem that we see is that often the markets are too small to really attract um, the large uh, typical investors that we see in different markets. Um, so one of the, 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 the pathway that is investigated right now is how to create a better connection between the different islands for investors, um, you know, to try to bundle together similar initiatives on the same island, let's say seaweed farming. Um, the challenge that we have here is that the, the type of governance that we have on different islands is, is really different. So if you look at um, St. Lucia, it's going to be completely different, let's say, than the Turks and Caicos, which is an overseas territory, and St. Lucia is its own country. So you already intrinsically don't have a lot of, you know, like I was talking about, connection and communication between the different islands when, when it comes to policies. So it, it's, it's an even higher hurdle to go over when it comes to investments. Mm -hmm. So we, there is a lot of um, talk in the space right now to try to educate not only investors, but also um, potential recipients of those investments, be it uh, the, the government or uh, private uh, entrepreneurs on the different islands to see what investors are looking for and how we can um, 
I don't want to say capacity building because it's more than that. It's really shifting the mentalities and see how we can um, create traction uh, between, you know, uh, but create traction from private investors by by grouping islands together and making investment more um, easy to understand for typical investors. Like, like for example, if you take the, the seaweed industry, you know, um, one of the things that investors look at is, that, I mean, savvy investors, let's put it like that, really want to understand what they are investing into. You know, they want to entire the entire. They want to understand the entire value chain. And with seaweed, you have so many exit opportunities, so many, so many things that you can do with seaweed that you need to understand the pharmaceutical market and the nutri nutraceutical market and I don't know the, the the food the you know the food market. So it makes it very challenging for investors to understand you know the entire value chain um, because it's so intricate. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, saw, but Sarah Simons uh, provided a uh, chat in which she says that there's a real need for collaboration and coordination between governments to create a stronger enabling environment. Any thoughts on how to support this? Hmm. It's a very good question. <laughs> and it is a question that I'm actively working on. Um, so, um, as Chris mentioned in the very beginning, I work currently with 25 different islands um, on a um, EU, that's a European Commission project. And one of the mandates of that program is to increase connections between those 25 territories. And we see that it is it is the real challenge. And, and one way we we we're going to do that is to actually create workshop um with hands-on interaction for the different stakeholders for those different islands so um we we really see that when you have that island mentality you are stuck on your island and you see oh, the problem i have is so specific to my island is so unique there is no way anybody else in the world can understand what i'm going through um, but when you open communication chan uh, channels, like creating a um, community of practice, you know, uh, workshops where you can have um, one practitioner from one island going to another island, you start to create those, those connections between individuals and then between communities and then between um, hopefully governments. So one of the way we're working on that problem is to to creating channels of a communication the first one we being community of practices so um once a month we have um, um we invite different stakeholders on very specific um thematics uh, being um, resilience um marine biology and um, um sustainable energy and we invite them to communicate and to present their work what they are doing and also the solutions um they have found and and the hope is that once the program ends um the the, the human connections between individuals um, will be strong enough and the benefits that they are getting from those um, interaction will be strong enough that the, the network will continue after we artificially uh, prompt it up uh, with, with the program. So I think we need to start with human connections, uh, intensify those human connections between islands um, and, 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 and then um, create, uh, engage more communities that will engage more governments. Um, that's the approach we are taking. Um, Aaron and I were participating in a workshop in uh, June in uh, Barbados in which um, really almost for the first time we there was an opportunity for um, colleagues from uh, CARICOM countries uh, to interact with uh, colleagues from uh, American territories from the Virgin Islands uh, and Puerto Rico. And uh, it's amazing just how many barriers there are to doing that, including travel. <laughs> yep. It's difficult to, to get from the Northern Caribbean to the Southern Caribbean. So um, it's a huge challenge. And it, and it is expensive and it's not green, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, when we travel around the different territories and when we plan to bring different stakeholders, you know, you always have to balance the cost of doing an in-person event to the benefit that you will have. So, so I think that now we even more carefully try to plan those events uh, in, in, in advance to make sure that the benefits that we will have will continue for um, many, many years. A uh, couple of chats here <clears throat> from Sarah Simons again. Are you able to share the name of the uh, EC project that you're involved in? So sure, perhaps, yeah. <clears throat> perhaps you can follow up with that. <clears throat> and then uh, from Junior uh, Jegba Govergo from Africa, uh, Liberia and specifically. My question is why have the blue economy sustainable development and management haven't been internationally legislated into policies that will help uh, boost the achievement of the SDGs by 2030 or beyond? Why, why are there no international legislative policies? That would be fantastic. If we can do that, um, that would be great, but it's not that easy. Um, there is a lot of pull and traction and lobbying going on and, and, and passing, you know, and, and the blue economy, it's a vast concept, right? So you, you, you would need to have more targeted actions to be able to, 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 to legislate around that. Um, but there are, you know, steps that we can take that are discussed today. Um, and even in COP27, you know, some mm. elements of the blue economy, some elements of the sustainability, um, are already um, discussed at the international level. But I think we are not ready to have the blue economy, you know, um, because it's a too, too wide domain. It, 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 it encompasses too many different sectors to really be able to um, legislate on, on such a broad subject, um, at least at an international level. And it's interesting. And then, Sorry, go ahead. And then for the two projects, um, they are on my LinkedIn page, if you wanna look it up. But they are um, the Resembit project, which stands for um, Resilience, um, Marine Biodiversity uh, and Sustainable Energy Program. And the other program is the GO program, which stands for Green Overseas. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we have reached the end of the uh, hour for this seminar. So I want to thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Found it very interesting, and I certainly increased my uh, understanding of uh, what is encompassed within the blue economy. I have to say that I had a rather narrow focus, but this provides me with a a uh, broader vision of what it means, and hopefully. Uh, the participants in this uh, seminar will have a similar view. So thank you very much. And I just have to mention that um, this is a big day for Canada because we are playing in the World Cup against Belgium this afternoon. So, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs>